Hey, Salvador Brigman, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. And today we're speaking with a successful comic book creator, graphic novelist, however you would like to say. These are really interesting projects that have been launched by Top Cow Productions. Cool name as well, Top Cow Productions. These guys have, um, with their most recent campaign, Witchblade Hardcover Volume 2, this saga continues. They launched a successful Kickstarter, raised six figures, over $100,000, more than 1,200 backers, really great campaign and also this isn't their first one right so they've actually done a ton of different kickstarter campaigns i think they created yeah nine campaigns i'm looking it up right now nine campaigns and they're based in la so they've brought all of the teachings and learnings that they've had from these other successful projects and basically wanted to pass them on to you if you are willing right so their their lessons that are going to be passed on will be specific i think a little bit for the comic book campaigns that are out there and for the graphic novels but also a a lot of insights into Kickstarter as a whole. So this isn't just like for creative category. This is also for other types of projects. So I think you'll take a, some good takeaways on the process of launching a new campaign and product. And specifically, if you're in the creative category, some of the things that you got to be aware of that you have to do if you really want to check all of those boxes going into an upcoming fundraiser. So one of the things that I really admire about people like this is their approach to business and their way that they can monetize um, what's a kind of a difficult you know, subject to monetize, which is art and storytelling. They've been doing it not only for years on Kickstarter, but also even before that. So, so this is like, to me, a really cool interview and an insight into how anyone out there, if you have an interest, if you're an artist, artist, if you're a creative person, how you can actually pull something together that the masses and that more people can connect with, run a successful campaign for that, do e-commerce, and make sure that you hit it out of the park and you have a, a really good project. They have more than 50,000 likes on Facebook and, and fans there. They have a ton of uh, Instagram followers, just, uh, just shy of 20,000 Instagram followers. So this is a big campaign and a big project, and um, I hope that you take us some good values and lessons out of today's podcast episode. This also syncs in nicely with my book, The Kickstarter Launch Formula, which is available on Audible. And if you're interested, you can go to crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio. That will take you to the Audible version. That's crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio. Um, and that link will take you there. I think there's also, if you sign up for like a free 30-day trial of Audible, I think you get the book for free as well. So you have to check, double check. I'm not sure if they finished that promotion or not, but you can go to crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio to pick up a copy there. Thank you for tuning in. It's coming up right after this. This podcast episode is sponsored by The Gadget Flow. The Gadget Flow reaches over 28 million people and they've been around since 2012. They are Indiegogo and Kickstarter experts. They featured over 5,000 crowdfunding campaigns. And if you have a technology or design campaign, it is a great platform to generate awareness and get backers. You can check them out at thegadgetflow.com slash submit and list your project today. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. Today we have a six-figure campaigner on the show who's also helped and been instrumental with a bunch of other Kickstarter campaigns. I believe it's eight at the time I'm recording this. This is for Top Cow Productions, and the project we're talking about is Witchblade Hardcover Volume 2. It's an entire saga that is continuing with a brand new story and recollection of the legendary series. And we have Matt here, who's going to tell us a little bit about this project. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate having you on. For those that are listening, do you think you could shed some light on um, your sort of role in the project here and just sort of a bite-sized background? Yeah, my name is Matt Hawkins. I am the president and CEO of Top Cow Productions. It's one of the image comics company, the one founded and owned primarily by Mark Silvestri. Cyberforce was sort of our first book. Our most popular books include Witchblade, The Darkness. Witchblade was a TNT TV show. It was also a Japanese anime. The Darkness was those two video games that came out from 2K, 2K Games, 2008, 2012. That movie, Wanted with Curving Bullets, was based on one of our books. So, you know, I, most part, we're a publishing company. We produce and some of the content that goes into, into, into Hollywood. But for the most part, we just uh, write and sell comics. And some of these projects were yours personally, right? And then you also publish other artists. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I write about, probably about half the books that Top Cow publishes. We publish three or four books a month. Probably about 50 a year, and I probably write 20 to 25 of those. Okay, awesome. Cheapest writer. <laughs> yeah, it is very cheap to use me as a writer. <laughs> Maybe you could tell us just a tiny bit about Witchblade Hardcover Volume 2, this project. 
Can you just tell the readers a little bit about like the context of it as well? Yeah, Witchblade was created in 1995 by uh, Marcus Bestry, Mike Turner, Dave Wall, and Brian Haber. It went on to become one of Image Comics' most successful comic book series. I mean, we've sold probably 250 million comics worldwide, published in 55 different languages. I mean, I'm sorry, in 55 different countries, in 22 different languages, I think it is. And it's basically the story of a New York City cop gets a possession of an ancient artifact that has come down since, you know, the dawn of time and it, it latches it on to a woman of every generation and like so a lot of famous like, like Joan of Arc various women had this artifact it's essentially the idea of it is sort of a supernatural superhero series but the people and, and the people in our top cow universe they don't have actual powers their powers are given to them by these artifacts mm-hmm. like the witchblade is actually a little bracelet that Sarah Mazzini, the main character, wears. But she's a homicide detective, so she, you know, we sort of always like it, just kind of NYPD blues meets the X-Files, because the idea that Witchblade and these other artifacts um, is a sort of, it's kind of like the They Live movie from the 80s, where you put on the sunglasses and you see that there's actually another universe that we don't normally see. Mm-hmm. The idea in our supernatural universe is there are these things around us all the time, we, we cannot see them. But they're influencing, and so the gauntlet and these various other artifacts that give these people the ability to see in this universe allows them to realize what it's actually. Very cool, very cool. And you also have a lot of other rewards and stuff that come with that. My one of my first questions for you is: having run so many campaigns, you've definitely seen the Kickstarter ecosystem time and time again. Have you noticed anything that's changed, or is it the same kind of formula that's been working for you in the beginning that's now working when it comes to launching these projects? Well, I think it depends. Like, which play volume two is the second one. I mean, we did which play volume one last year. We did darkness volume one a few months ago. And then we did which play volume two. I was actually, we were a little concerned that a volume two might not do as well as a volume one, but it did great. So my internal fears were sort of unfounded. I, I wrongly sort of assumed that people went on Kickstarter to buy you know, volume one. That's what we've seen in sometimes throughout time in other instances. But no, I think there are people that comic stores have always been the life bread of our industry. Lifeblood, but uh, so many of them have shut down. I mean, when I started in comics in 1992, there were about 15,000 comic shops in North America. I think there's under a thousand now. I mean, I, I, the number of true comic shops in the United States is actually dwindling. Mm. The ones that are left are good. Um, and what, what's happening is it, it, it's a typical kind of shift in the Amazon culture or digital world that is kind of what, what is happening. You know, I mean, we have noticed the comicsology, Amazon digital comics, the PDF versions. They've done okay, you know what I mean? But I think industry-wide, we kind of realized that digital comics need to be something more. And I don't think uh, a lot of us have figured out how to make it more yet. I mean, right now, essentially, what we're offering digitally is the same product we're offering physically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that needs to change, in my opinion. But I think, you know what, the, the Kickstarters, in my opinion, is to make it an event. We have the advantage of preaching to an established fan base. So I think most of our fans um, probably were fans of ours before. There probably are some new people from Kickstarter, but Kickstarter actually tracks where people come from. So like if I click something on, if I put a link up on Twitter, one of the things we've done internally, and I recommend that people do this, is through the Kickstarter system, you can actually create like 30 different links for your Kickstarter that will all take you to the Kickstarter main page. And what you can do by that is link them out, meaning put some on your Twitter, put one on your Twitter, put one on your Instagram, and see where your people are coming from, you know, and then you figure out if you getting zero people in your Twitter feed, but you're getting a lot of people from Instagram, try to adjust and figure out how can you appeal more to Twitter people, or is it just the same thing? You know, I mean, that's sometimes how it goes, but, you know, I think we're, we have an advantage of having a 30-year company and established bandits, but the great thing about Kickstarter, I see it all the time, people come up with a good idea, you know, they put a little effort into it, they start to build a small audience. It's very common now in comics, I see this almost every week. Where there'll be some Kickstarter or, or Indiegogo somewhere about an independent comic book property. It's usually something I've never heard of before. It's a creator I've never heard of before. And then I'll do a little bit of research. Usually it's someone who has web comic. Mm-hmm. Ones that are successful are the ones that a comic book creator or writer had a web comic they were giving away for free. They built up a few hundred or a few thousand followers on Twitter or Facebook or wherever. They then turned around and tried to monetize that. And I think you can do this once as a creator. You can't do this as a company where you can say, Please help my dream come through and help me monitor. You know, I've given you this free comic for two years now or a year or six months, whatever, excuse me, whatever it is. You know, can you please chip into my Kickstarter campaign and, and I'll give you a print edition? Help make my dream come true. I think when you have a small fan base inside, it's 
and you're engaged with them, you can do that and pull it off and you're able to pull that off once. So I recommend any individual who's going on Kickstarter for the first time, I would recommend they, they play that angle. Yeah. They're like, please help my dream come true. True to the most part. I mean, I don't, I don't recommend that these people go on there late in July, but uh, for the most part, it's not. I've always wanted to publish a comic book. I've always wanted to write a comic book. You wrote or published. You can do it. Yeah. Well, one of the things I've noticed about your campaign is looking at some of these other Kickstarters, they have extremely like polished videos, right? And they've spent a lot of money and they've invested a ton of financial resources in making a very high production quality pitch video. Yours seems to go kind of this other route, right? Which is a little bit more authentic and just kind of talking to the camera. Why do you think you can get away with that? Because a lot of other beginning creators seem like they need more of the high production route. It could be as simple as we're a known commodity. We have existing fans. I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know why that is. But we've always done it that way. You know, from the first campaign, it was just Mark and I getting on there and talking, maybe with one other creator. We'd cut it together and put it up. So that's just the way we've always done it. I mean, the first one we did was Cyberforce back in 2011. And to date, that first one was the one we raised the most money for, 175000 or something like that. I think we're pretty close to over a million at this point in, in terms of money we've raised on crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. Okay. When it comes to the stretch goals, this is like another common question that I get. How do you think through that? Is there like a strategy... Are you imagining what we can get to? Like, how do you think about the stretch goals internally? Well, we think about it in terms of number of backers that we turn and, and dollar amount. Both of those matter. We want to try to get more people involved because we've noticed that if you look at the number of backers on our campaign, it's been fairly consistent. On this most recent one, we actually had more backers, a little more than the last one. And I was a little shocked by that because it went from Darkest Volume 1 to Wishblade Volume 2. Not by, not by a lot, but it, it was an interesting uh, note of notice on our part. And I think getting these, so we focus on trying to get new people to try it. Because the one thing that we do, and this is critical to, and I'm assuming that people understand this, we do the fulfillment, we do it on time, and we do it very well. You know, one of the things you don't get from our Kickstarters is people do get their rewards. They're very well packed. People sometimes bitch about the cost of our shipping, but... You know, we've told people that before. It's like, we're not Amazon, and we're shipping your book to your way. It's going to cost some money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. When it comes to the stretch goals as well, for those that aren't familiar, so this is basically something that people get as an add-on. Is it something that they get regardless of if they pledge to the Kickstarter? How do you describe stretch goals to people who are unfamiliar with that? Well, what it is, is we do both. We offer stuff that's just a free add-on, meaning you get an extra thing without even asking or bothering. We also add things that are available that aren't you have to pay for, either through CrowdOx after. That's another big important thing, by the way. We may not see these numbers in public, but CrowdOx, we've done our last multiple campaigns. Our back end, after the fact, using them has been significant. I, I would say in the last three campaigns, we've probably generated, between those three campaigns, six figures on its own. Not collect up stuff because people come in. What crowd on? You should make all of the things available that are in it. And you can, and if you are a pledger, you can go in and then cherry pick, add on certain things you want to get. And then we add things that are only available there. It, it's a lot of it's just merchandise. You know, you, you create merch that people want. You know, stuff that's cool and interesting. I mean, we've we've tried different things. I mean, we've tried tote bags. You know, we haven't tried action figures, statues. Some of that stuff we'll to make. But, uh, you know, we've done hats and shirts and, and... So what you're saying is that after the campaign finishes and you do the survey and fulfillment via CrowdOx, there's an opportunity for you to upsell people and that could be like a 30% extra revenue or something. Yes. And that figure is actually kind of accurate, about 30%. And when it comes to that, is there a reason you chose CrowdOx over some of these other tools like BackerKit, for example? Solely based on personal recommendations. I mean, we were going to go with back a bit, and then actually Brian Polito, Chaos Comics, is an old friend of mine, and he does a lot of Kickstarters, and he and I are buddies, and so I talked to him about what he did, and he said, I, I use these back a bit, now I use the out, they're better. And I told one of my guys, uh, Henry, the marketing guy, I said, go research this and see if this is true. And he did, came back and said, the crowd has had better terms. Like, crowd ox. Makes a lot of sense. When you were kind of getting your early days here, you know, before you were putting out regular books and regular artwork, is this something that was like your full-time job? Were you working on this part-time? Like, how did this start for you? I started working in different comics in April of 1993 while I was still in college. I was in college to actually go into, into science, and I graduated with that degree but never used it. I started working with Rob Liefeld in April of 1993 and worked with him until 96 or 7, whenever his company crashed initially. And then I worked with him at Central for a couple of years. 
doing Lady Pendragon and a couple of the books. And then in 99, Top Gun hired me. Like Mark Spencer hired me summer 99. And I've been there ever since. So what is that? 21 years, 22 years. So you've been in the industry for a while, Teams. Yeah, this is my uh, 29th year in the industry. When it comes to this, I think that Kickstarter and sort of in general selling online has really unlocked this for like the beginning creator. Because before, there's very little ways you could get the word out, right? It's very difficult to get any kind of market penetration, they call it, or getting people to be aware of who you are, right? If you're worried about the fulfillment and shipping part of your Kickstarter campaign when it comes to getting out all those perks and rewards to your backers, rest assured I've put together a complete Kickstarter fulfillment and shipping checklist for you, and it's free. This is sponsored by the folks at FulfillRight. And they thought that you should have this checklist as part of your arsenal going into a crowdfunding campaign. If you want to get instant access to this checklist and it's free, you can go to fulfillright.com slash checklist. Again, that is F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E dot com slash checklist. Fulfillright.com slash checklist. Just go to that link and you can download it immediately. Do you think that this is like a golden age? Do you think that this is something that's here to stay? Is it something that's just right now in the public conscious? What do you think of that? Um, I don't see it going away because there are people who like it. You know, I mean, the bands that we have, the thousand, the few people that buy from us by a Kickstarter, you know, those those people like it. They like the extra rewards. You know, a lot of times the stuff we make, our primary business, has, we make a lot of money in conventions. And last year there were no and it was a brutal year, so Kickstarter kind of helped us that. I mean, we've been crowdfunding since 2011, so it wasn't a new thing. We weren't doing it to replace existing product lines. We are doing it to extend, but what essentially happened last year, it kind of saved us because there were three months, March to June, where the industry shut down completely. There were no new comics being published. Distributors weren't paying, you know, because there were not, there was no publications. And several companies actually went out of business, you know. We very quickly, when that happened a year ago, stuff started happening. We, we identified that uh, we were going to do a much stronger push through crowdfunding because it was something we actually had control of. We were hoping that the fans that we had would, would not be completely broke just code or, or whatever. Yeah. It, it worked for us. You know, I think, I think the key is not to put all your eggs in the basket. You know, I mean, I, I've always been a prominent fan of trying to get our product in as many distribution channels as possible. And honestly, for me, and corporately, I, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of, I think it's, you know, really, you know, you know that cereal, like, you look at any major branded items are, they, you know, there are sometimes major branded items that are only available and limited. And there is a, a, a way, especially in comics and in merchandise, playing sort of that collector game. But for the most part now, fans more than anything, they want value. Mm-hmm. They want value of stuff that they actually want. You know, comic books and entertainment do tend to thrive during the sessions. We were, we were somewhat worried about the number of people out of work and all the stuff going on around people because, you know, when shit's going down, how many people are reading comics? I, I don't know. I might be wrong. But uh, it was a big concern of ours. It doesn't seem to have happened. Um, our fan base uh, seems to have remained intact, and, and we've actually built upon it in the crowdfunding world. So it's just kind of nice. What are your thoughts on some of these things like Facebook ads, you know, where a lot of physical products are utilizing that on, on Kickstarter? Is that something you guys explore at all? I actually do like uh, social media ads. I like SEO advertising. We don't do a lot of it. We do it. We do it very targeted. The one thing I actually like about social media advertising is, you know, if we have a project that's about a fireman, I can go and do a social media ad for anyone that says they're a fireman in, in the contiguous United States or, or whatever I want to say. You can, the nice thing is you can super target social media you're advertising, and you can spend fifty bucks. And it can actually be fun because you can, you, can, you can get yourself in front of 100 people that would actually buy your suit versus getting in front of millions who wouldn't. You know, one of the things I've always hated about shows like San Diego Comic Con and some of these bigger conventions is we show up to these places with huge booths and we work really, really hard. But now, these days, almost two thirds of the people that walk through those shows have no interest in comic book product at all. Mm-hmm. The movies, the soap operas, there's whatever porn chick might be there. I mean, they're cosplay. There's a million reasons, and it's really expanded the convention audience. But it's made it more difficult for us to make money on some of these bigger shows. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know, just so you know, I mean, this has been the only show I've done. I did a show a year ago, January 28th, I think it was. It was in Raleigh, South Carolina. That was the last show I did. And that's weird for me because in the 29 years I've been 
business. I can't think of a two month period of time where I wasn't going somewhere to some convention to sell product and be out in front of. The nice thing about comics is you can actually meet the people. You know, whether it's conventions or online or these kind of things. Uh, you know, I don't think we're that famous. You know what I mean? I mean, we have fans and stuff like that, but even people with 100,000 readers, you know, it's not like they walk around the grocery store and people know who they are. Mm -hmm. It's still, I imagine, a very rewarding feeling, right? Um, knowing that people are following you and following the story and the stuff that you create. Like, that's a really cool feeling, I think. Uh, you know, it is. And it, it is really cool when I think about it. I have to say, I've been doing it for so long. I, I definitely am a bit jaded. And I, I think a lot of the, the coolness of some of it has worn off on me at this point. Because I've been writing a couple of comics. First comic I wrote was 95. I've probably written, I've written 600 books. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's just publishing a new comic is cool. And I like it. I really like publishing stuff that's based on my own ideas. It's like when I come up and write an original concept or idea and publish it, that, that honestly is very graphic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just have a couple more questions for you here. One of them was on the reward tiers, right? So it looks like you guys have reward tiers that sell out. Do you have any thoughts on early bird tiers versus like time-based rewards? Because that's a newer thing, right? With Kickstarters, you can have a time-based reward. What are your thoughts on that? We love it. I mean, we do like in the first. Here, here's what we've noticed: you have a huge swell in the first three or four days. There's a huge swell in the last three or four days, and that dollar amount is usually about fifty percent of the total in those six fucking days. And that always kind of blows my mind because if you go the middle of twenty-two or twenty-four days or whatever it is, you'll sort of string along. And I think that's where people, I think need to understand that there's going to be a huge push in the beginning for people to see it, like it, or support it. And then you're going to need a little bit of time. And, and see, I've, we've struggled with the idea of, of lessening the campaign lengths, but I actually, I, I would encourage people to not do that. I think it's good to, we go out of our way to make sure straddle at least two, maybe three paycheck periods. You know, I looked at the first and the 15th of the Fridays, and I'm like, okay, you can get paid, you're really going to get paid. You know, so these are things that, that matter. I mean, you should end your campaign at a point where people recently got paid, you know, because if you want that 11th hour surge, people have to have money. Yeah, 100%. And I don't think it's really thought about, honestly, a lot, or even like the best data launch, for example. Well, and that's, I think that's kind of a, a mistake that, that is absolutely, because the thing is, if you shorten the time, which I see a lot of people doing, I don't think you get that, that in, because what happens is the middle of three weeks is all marketing. You know, people spread the word, it's up. It usually becomes like recommended by Kickstarter or you know, whatever. Go see their apparatus. And then we continue just to push on it for the whole time. I would encourage people to try to make the campaign and try to make the whole thing itself as entertaining as possible. You know, I mean, if people are fans of this person or this book or whatever it is, I have to show a lot. I mean, one thing about comic books especially is most of the times when we run these Kickstarters, these books are for the most part almost already done. That way we have art to show, we can mock up sort of what looks like actual merchandise and prints and various things, the art. I just think, you know, you know, there is a fear, I think, that we've overcome because we've done eight successful campaigns and, and we've fulfilled everyone and we have people coming back. But there's a lot of campaigns where the moment is kind of shitty, you know, or spotty, or people say they never got stuff, stuff gets damaged. I think the, the hardest thing for some people is, is knowing how to ship the stuff. Because the one thing about comics that people don't seem to understand is if these are collectible items, they need to be pristine. You can't ship it with a bent corner. If you ship it with a bent corner, they're going to want their money back. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally. I mean, if it gets creased and run over by the post office, they're going to want to return it. That's why our shipping is so expensive, because we, you know, we put packing bubbles and all kinds of stuff. You have a lot of care, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of care. And one thing I can tell you, as someone who orders Kickstarter very all the time, or my friends, I can't tell you how often I've gotten shit delivered People I even know, or it's like, or it's clear that you know, at the same level of care, what we do it that we we do. And see, for us, it's, it's uh, I think people look at Kickstarter wrongly. I think they look at it as way to get their business started, to get things going. To me, it is our, it is a part of our business, and we treat it accordingly. You know, there used to be a comic book rep at Kickstarter. She got let go last year at some point, but she just told me I think the stat was like. Only one in three of these comic book Kickstarters are actually successful. Mm -hmm. That means two out of three are run. And here's what I would say. Go online and look at the ones that succeed and look at the ones that fail and, and analyze. I mean, it's, it's all there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I don't know if people need professional video. Because the thing is, there's something that depends on what it is. Like, if it was IBM or something, like Microsoft, they didn't have a super high production 
to do with everybody else and their thing. I think people would be like, that's weird. But when you have a, a small sort of company like Top Cow, where you know there really are only two principals, and the fans have almost everyone. I, I, I bet the vast majority of read my books have met me. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's uh, and that's weird. The authors don't have that, like novelists, they don't have that. You know, so I just I travel all over the place. That's how I get my fame, and that's also a great way to use both Kickstarters actually go to conventions. I can't do that now with COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We often will target launch Kickstarter around a large convention, and the reason being is because we have panels, we have a booth, we can hand out little flyers, we can talk to people at the booth. We get a pretty decent search from that. That's something we've been unable to do over the last year because it's shut down. But I'm looking forward to getting to see something back. So my last question for you here is for someone in the audience who has yet to make their first comic book or their first graphic novel, what do you recommend in terms of when they should begin to think about Kickstarter? Is it after they have the prototype? Is it after they have the story fully baked? Like when should they begin to think about Kickstarter? Wow. They don't know what they're doing. I almost, and I know that's hard because a lot of people, if you're a writer, you need the money probably to pay the artist. The problem is, if you don't have a fan base go on Kickstarter, I, I don't know how you... I really genuinely don't know how you get attention. You know, I mean, because we've never had that problem. So maybe in your interviews with people that have sort of been successful, most of the common people I know that are running Kickstarters, they've been successful at it pretty much every time. And then there's a large group of people that I've seen that have had, you know, maybe they ran one and raised $2,000, or maybe they, you know, they raised, they did one and, and it was supposed to have 5000 but they only raised four, so they didn't do it. There's a lot of those smaller dollar amounts. I would say the more important factor is to build a fan base. You know, and the best way to do that is to give it away for free initially to attract people to your content. Because if no one knows who you are, no one's ever heard of you before, let them try it. Sampling is a uh, is a good thing, especially in comics, because you can sample and read a comic very quickly, and you, within five minutes you can know whether you like it. Or not. You can't know that about a novel, a film, or even a TV show. Yeah. So basically, put in the effort to build a fan base a bit, and then consider monetizing that by doing a crowdfunding campaign. Yeah, I think when people launch crowdfunding campaigns and they fail, I actually because I think you know people people aren't dumb, and I think when you've heard. Yeah, and there's, I, I'm not sure I've seen a company that came out of the gate and launched one that failed, that then launched a second one that succeeded. I'm sure there are. I just don't know. That. Yeah. Some people that have tried and failed, and they didn't try again. That most of the people I know have done. It's just a lot harder than I think people think. I think some people just make it look really easy, but you know, we make it look really easy because it's very coordinated. There's five or six people involved in getting it put together. The other key is communication updates. Because even I'll tell you what happens all the time. You have a, a book like uh, that uh, doesn't come out, or doesn't come out, and people you know are wondering. And then, like, let's say you're running late, or let's say the book is even on time, but you're you're saying like putting out a book that's not going to come out until May, and, and you're paying the money right now. Well, what happens by March? You're wondering where the book is because they spent the money, they forgot that it said it was being delivered, and then you end up having people being pissy when they shouldn't. And I think the way to avoid sort of that in the communication is using updates to uh, part of the campaign after the fact. I think a lot of people make the mistake of once they fund and they get their money, they kind of stop communicating with people. They just ship the product out and hope, you know, and they'll deal with a few people who have returns or whatever. But It's important to stay communicative and treat it almost like customer service, right? I mean, these people... Customer. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to treat it that way. And I think that's one of the things why I think we have such a success rate and reputation in terms of numbers. Because we've treated our existing... Essentially, for us, I don't know what the people we got by a Kickstarter. It wouldn't surprise me if there were some. I imagine there are some. It also wouldn't surprise me that they were all existing customers. I don't know for sure. We don't have a way to identify that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I mean, we asked the surveys and they actually people don't understand what we're trying to do. Well said. Well, I mean, these are a lot of great tips, man. I really appreciate all of the things that you're you're sharing. You're being very transparent. I think for anyone who's just starting to hear some of these advice and teachings will really be helpful. So I appreciate that. Where can people go to learn more about some of your artwork and also some of the stuff that Top Cow Productions is coming out with? Well, we have uh, social media on pretty much every platform. So if you just go to Facebook, Twitter, anywhere, and Google Top Cow, you can find our main feed. And off that, you'll find Mark's Mystery feeds and my feeds. And both of us are pretty, we talk very differently, but Mark's an artist. He talks a lot about his art and the art projects. I usually talk more about 
publications and stories and what we're doing. So the feeds are very different. So we have kind of different followings for that reason. Awesome. Cool, man. Thank you for joining on the podcast. Appreciate all of your advice and tips and look forward to your next campaign launch. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. So on this episode, we got super in-depth into the graphic novel or Kickstarter comic book category. Um, they've published some great stuff, Witchblade, Death Vigil, um, Think Tank, The Postal, you know, a lot, a lot of cool stuff. So go and check them out. Go and check out Top Cow. We have a good Instagram. You can also check out my Instagram if you want more advice and tips on crowdfunding. Just search me up, Salvador Brigman. You can also search me on YouTube and I will come up. Also, my blog, crowdcrux.com, with some tips and advice there if you're more of a reader. I think about doing a blog rebrand soon, actually. So you might see some cool new stuff there if you check that out in the future. I've been super working hard, man. I've been working with clients. I've been doing coaching students. I've been coming, working on a new book. Sort of the planning stage is there of something that I want to complete this year. So I've been very busy, excitedly, obviously, with my work. And as I get older, some of the things that I think about are just like, what are the the horrible experiences that entrepreneurs have when they're trying to create something new, right? Whether that's the, how do you get marketing? How do you get traffic? But also from the psychology standpoint, also from the product creation standpoint, also from the logistical standpoint, I think that there are very poor educators in this niche and just not very good people who can tell you as it is and tell you step by step in a, in a very simple fashion what you got to do to get something out there. I think there's just so much like romanticism and mysteriousness and mystery, I guess, romanticism and mystery, we'll say, behind launching something new. Like we think of entrepreneurs, like that's such a big word, you know, or we think of like artists and it's like what they do, creativity is something that cannot be explained. But I disagree with that fundamentally. And I think that you can learn from other people who are creative, other people who are business minded. And it's really, to me, the lack of understanding of teachers who are not able to digest this and spread it to you and to lay it out for you in a very easy to understand way. So I don't think that if you found like you tried to launch a product before, let's just say, and you're like, this is so complicated. This is so annoying. I don't understand it. I feel like there's no guidance. I don't really know what I'm doing. I feel uncertain. I'm scared. Right? If you feel a lot of those emotions when you're going through this process, I don't think you're alone. I think most people feel that way. And it's honestly, it's not even your fault. It's not your fault because you're just trying to get something cool out there, right? You're just trying to create something that's going to impact other people and spread the word and hopefully impact a lot of lives to the positive. So it's no way your fault, I think, for feeling these ways. I honestly think it's a failure of the educational system and of existing teachers who cannot communicate in the ways that need to in order to help people get their products out there to the masses. So I went on a little bit of a rant there, right? But um, this is the whole reason why I put together this podcast to speak one on one with people like this to disseminate that information straight to you and to become kind of like a an intermediary in that way and, and sharing those teachings with you as well as my own, obviously, my own in my book, The Kickstarter Launch Formula. Um, you can download an audible copy at crowdcrux.com slash Kickstarter audio. I try to document as much as I can everything you need to do in order to launch a successful campaign and to, and to bring it to you in a very bite-sized, non-corporate fashion. So many corporate people out there will love to throw, throw around like words like minimum order quantity and injection molding, and you got to do this. You got to have quality marketing analytics and optimized metrics in order to improve the lifetime value and ROI of a customer. It sounds like you're speaking a freaking different language, you know, and it's really, in my opinion, just used to mask what the simple things you do have to do, which is make sure someone is your customer for a long time. Buy enough of this product so you can get a good price, minimum order quantity. Get your product made into plastic in a mass produced quantity. That's what injection molding is, right? People will mask using these really big terms, what I just think are, are very confusing. And my whole goal, the premise of this show is to take those big words and to take those really fancy, um, I guess, ways of processes of going about this and to bring it down to a level that you can easily understand that even a child, you know, someone who's five years old or 10 years old, if I explain it to them, like, hey, you got a toy, this thing is made of plastic. If you want to make a lot of plastic toys, you need this thing called injection molding. They're like, oh, okay, th 
that makes sense. This is this allows me to make lots and lots of little plastic toys, right? It, it makes complete sense. So my goal is to demystify this for you. And if you'd like to play a small part in helping me do that for other people, number one, please subscribe to this podcast. Number two, spread the word if you can, would mean a lot to me. Follow me on Instagram, give me some support there so other people can see that you're tuned in. And uh, I appreciate you. I really appreciate your time that you're putting into learning this, this craft. And I hope that I can continue sharing great advice and teachings with you. My name is Sal, and I will see you next time.